So uh, first I want to talk a little bit about grounding it in who we are at Lurie Children's, what, what we believe, what we stand for. Um, someone in the last panel talked about Simon Sinek, and um, I'm a big fan. And so one of the first things I did when I got on board is I asked, I got a team together, a uh, cross-functional team, some surgeons, some physicians, some chiefs and chairs, some people in the trenches, and we spent a lot of time talking about what our purpose is, and we went through a number of purpose workshops. It works now. Yay! Steve, it's turn on the on. Oh, the on thing. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> and um, this is what we articulated. We said that everything we do is for a child. That is who we are, but our why is relentlessly pursuing a healthier future for every child. That is why everybody got, comes to work every day. There's 6,000 of us committed to that purpose. So that's who we are. We, we um, brought that together in this sort of brand line, brand idea of all for your one, everything we do is for a kid. Um, so that was like step one, right? Walked in the door, step one, we need a brand idea. Um, and then step one, Jillian, was thinking about how does social fit into this piece. So that, um, that's our purpose, we serve we're the largest and top ranked children's hospital in Illinois. We're in the top 10 in the country. We serve about 200,000 unique patients every year, so uh, lots of stuff, right? Lots of people. Our marketing strategy simply is we have a whole bunch of one-on-one -on -one marketing, right? We, well, just like what you guys talked about, we have to sit down with referring docs and say, if your kid needs a tonsillectomy, send him to us, or if your kid has some really strange melanoma or needs a heart transplant, here's why these doctors are important. So a whole bunch of one-on-one -on -one marketing. Then we have a decent amount of one-to-many marketing because our, our idea is not really a mass idea, right? If you don't have kids or um, a sick kid in particular, we're not for you, right? So we're not really a mass brand. So we do a whole bunch of one-to-many marketing but we do do some mass marketing because we're a nonprofit. So we need your, if we, if we can't get your kid, we'll take your check, right? <laughs> so we need to talk to a bunch of people about that. So that's broadly our, um, how we think about marketing. Yes, it did work. So Hope asked me to talk about the role of social. And what, the way we think of the role of social is to amplify these conversations, right? If we can take some of that one-to-one -one and really put a megaphone on it, then we're, we're, we're winning. And we do that in a couple of ways. First, we turn our Twitter feed over to the departments. So we let the Department of Pediatrics tweet out every day. We let the Department of Child and Adolescent Psych tweet out. So we turn our Twitter feed over to the departments and they have their followings, right? So, so the cancer docs have a whole bunch of Probably you guys who are trying to sell cancer meds to them, <laughs> follow them, as well as parents, etc. So we turn our Twitter feed over to them. We have a playbook so that they follow the rules and all that stuff, but they do that. And then um, we have, we man a couple of different Facebook sites, one for the big brand and then one for fundraising and then a couple for some of the individual parent groups. And then Instagram, same thing. We have about four different Instagram feeds that, that we push out. But all of it is really about amplifying those relationships and conversations. That's the role of it. What we wanted to talk about today, as Hope said, is you know we, we've had a lot of luck on viral. And um, viral doesn't just happen. There's a big piece of luck involved, right? But it doesn't just happen. And so um, I think it's super fun to make up words. I, I make them up every day at home, so why not make them up at work? I think the rule for really going viral is this made up word called strucky. I think you need a little strategy and a little luck, right? Because no matter how much strategy you have, if, you, if it doesn't catch fire, it doesn't catch fire. So I've had so many people say, make this one go viral. I can't make this one go viral. <laughs> that's, that's the luck piece, right? But, but we're never going to get lucky without strategy. So that strucky idea is what's behind it all. So I'm going to take a little time and um, 
teach you how to strucky. <laughs> we all remember the teach me how to dougie thing, right? So here's how we think about it. First thing is you got to plan for the poll, right? There's push and pull in social, and you have to plan for the poll. You can't just hope for it. So, you know, we can push things out that amplify the message, that deepen the relationship, but we have to plan for that pull and make sure that when people hold on to it, it's going to really, truly create relationships. Right? We have to give people the materials they need so that when they pull it out into the world, it's exactly what, or close to what we want to happen. It's not exactly, but close. So plan for the pull. The next thing is remember who you're talking to. And at the hospital, we have a couple of personas that we speak to all the time. We have Dr. Dave, because he looks so kindly and trustworthy. <laughs> and Dr. Dave is a pediatrician, but he is a leading edge pediatrician. He does a lot of writing and researching. He's not just your average, you know, almost ready to retire doc. He really keeps involved. He's on the cutting edge. So he's an important piece of who we talk to. We talk to, we call her Worried Wanda, Worried Mom. And there's a jillion Worried Moms. And so um, we have to think about that and how we talk to Worried Mom. And this is Millie the Millennial, and she's trying to change the world one tweet at a time. So she's really important too, because we want really to connect with her. So having personas is a great tool in your Strucky toolbox. Is on, and this stuff is based on data. Like it sounds goofy and fun, but there's a whole lot of data and customer journey work that goes into this that kind of boils up to having Dave and Wanda and Millie. And then, if you don't have one, you need a content calendar. And that is the most important thing. It really keeps everything together. We organize our content calendar around three big buckets, our big bets which are the things that we are putting money behind for the year, the things that we really want to get strucky about, right? We want people to take that stuff and run with it. It's the important stuff. The second piece is the drumbeat topics. This is, this, this is that steady rhythm we want out in the world. We want you to be thinking this about us, and so we want to create a steady rhythm around the drumbeat topics, and then the nice to do's, which for us are that sort of um, news you can use, the mom mindset stuff, right? It's back to school, it's Halloween, healthy treats, vaccinations, that kind of stuff. But, but this stuff is not going to raise the, raise the platform for Lurie Children's. This is the stuff that kind of anybody could give them, but it's nice for us to have it out there. So that's why we call it a nice to do. And we align everything we want to do around this stuff, and then this helps us be organized. And, and this is the strategy part of Strucky. So, um, content calendar. No matter how you do it, you got to do it. And when I when I walked in three and a half years ago, we, we weren't doing it. People, I was like, well, how do you know that you're gonna? Do well, I mean, we always kind of talk about heart in February. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. <laughs> So this, this was a really, really important exercise, and it seems simple, but it really, really helps. And then um, this is ultimately what you want. This is the Strucky Shuffle. Um, you really want the listener to become the teller, right? That's where winning happens, is if you can create a story where the listener becomes the teller, and, that, and you keep that triangle going. And, and in the case of the couple examples that I'm going to take you through, we worked really hard to keep that shuffle alive, right? We kept telling new pieces of the story so that the listener could keep telling new pieces of the story. And we didn't let the story just go out there and cross our fingers. So that piece is really an important part. And so here's how we did it. Capturing the beat of the heart center. So the story of the heart center for us was really important. This is, again, back to that content calendar. We were um, approaching 30 years and 300 heart transplants. That's a big deal. We do more heart transplants than just about anyone else. Any given year, there might be a couple more in Texas or a couple more in Boston, but we're up there. And we're, we are anywhere between one and three in the number of pediatric heart transplants. So we do a ton of them. So this was going to be a newsworthy year. So on our content calendar, we were paying really close attention to the heart center. 
and we really wanted to understand everything that was going on there. We had a whole bunch of paid media, some good old-fashioned advertising out there around the Heart Center, as well as doing a lot of editorial content, things like that. <laughs> so, so, again, we had news. We just didn't have like a, gosh, it'd be nice to talk about the Heart Center. We had news, and we really focused on it. How we do it, we have, um, we actually have someone whose job title is story catcher. And this was um, a job we created about a year and a half ago. And oh my gosh, has this paid dividends. So Bridget Gamble is our story catcher. We hired her, I think, from the AMA. And she, this is Bridget, and she spends tons of time working the floors, getting to know the caregivers, the docs, the surgeons, and most important, the patients and their families. And she keeps everybody HIPAA compliant. She walks around with a stack of releases. She runs a database. And she is always hunting for emotional truths and meaningful stories. And that has paid so many dividends for us. Because otherwise, it would be like, well, this doctor said this family's good. But what the docs are looking for is very different than what we might be looking for. Right? And so Bridget knows what makes a good story, where are the compelling emotional truths. And in her database, she flags things like would be great on camera. Maybe not great on camera, but it's a great story. So we, we have probably about five owned publications. So this is really important too because we're always, con I mean you all know, content's everything and we're always hungry for content. So having somebody working the floors and getting to know the patient families and getting to know what's happening on the floors has helped enormously. So that um, number one for our Strucky right there. And then because Bridget was working the floors, we found out um, this is where it started with Holy Balls. So I'm gonna press this and let you get to know our friend, Justin. <clears throat> because we were living in the heart center. We really wanted to push the heart center. We really wanted to talk about transplant. And we knew that this is one of the transplant surgeons. And, and he had found out that um, our guy was pretty into Star Wars. And so he had told our team that when there's a heart, we'll let you know because he's gonna deliver it as a character from Star Wars. <laughs> so that was super awesome. He. he it's so funny. Justin said, um, you guys showed the whole world me and my boxer shorts. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, there's always trade-offs with everything, right? <laughs> it, it goes back to, is there any such thing as bad publicity? Well, not for us, but maybe for a uh, you know, preteen boy. But, um, we got a ton of impressions, a whole bunch of placements, and started the momentum with that story. And now, you guys talked about it in the panel, like the idea of creating that notion of trust and this is gonna work. So now the docs were like, totally the doors are open because it worked. So we had this proof point that we could say, okay, we are gonna be just sniffing around the halls every day and just get ready for it. So we did. And then, we found out that we had this charming, um, at the time, 10-year-old girl from Naperville who was waiting for a heart, and um, she had all kinds of spunk. She was known as very spunky from the get-go. And one of her caregivers told our team that she's obsessed with Drake, and she would love it if we just filmed her doing the Kiki Challenge. Now, none of us knew, well, I think uh, maybe one person on my team who knew what that was, <laughs> but most of us didn't. 
And um, let me play that for you, because this is how it all started. Embedded video is the right way to go, but then you can't use the clicker. <laughs> oh, wait. What happened? Why did it go the wrong way? It's going to go right down there. There we go. Right holding the boom box <laughs> as, as she was doing it. And she, she was in heart, major heart failure, and this is before we put her on the ventricular assisted device, the bad. And so she was really frail, super skinny, and, um, but still, as everyone said, super spunky. So this ignited the spark, and we all fell in love with her. All of her caregivers loved her, our team loved her. She was um, just that vibrant personality. So to that strucky notion, right, the strategy was to focus on the heart transplant, the heart center, focus on transplant, and then get lucky, right? And Sophia was our lucky charm because she had so much personality. We knew that if we just followed her around and kept our fingers crossed that everything went well, she'd be amazing, and she was. So fanning the flame. So um, on August 13th, Sophia asked Drake to visit. So um, her birthday was coming up. She asked Drake to visit. Then on August 15th, what we did, and again, this is part of that notion of being strucky, we got local media in the hospital to interview her. We started that push of really that combination of earned and social. So local media came in the hospital, they interviewed her, they fell in love with her. Um, we saw from our social listening, this thing was starting to build. So we started sending out things to other social channels that weren't picking it up so they could. So this whole idea of viral, you got to fan the flames. We had people doing this like all, all day, all night, sending out releases, keeping <coughs> all the social channels involved, keeping it alive. It doesn't just happen unless you keep it alive. So Drake was in Chicago that weekend, and she, she said she wanted two things for her birthday. She was turning 11. She wanted Drake to come see her, or at least call her. And she wanted a heart. So, you know, she was already on the list for the heart, and we said, you know, that's a fingers crossed thing. Everybody, just so you all know, everybody has to get in the same line. No matter if Drake visits you or you're, or not, you're in the same line. So it didn't change her status on the donor list. But so we started a social push. Drake's name on in social media is Champagne Poppy. So we started a social push behind this, saying, you know, hey, Champagne Poppy, call Sophie. So we started this big push, and it turns out because Drake is an incredibly nice guy. He's Canadian. <laughs> incredibly nice guy. Like everybody knows somebody who knows him. It's like that thing. Like he's just the guy next door, right? So everybody knows somebody who knows him. That started picking up. He got a million calls and we got a call um, on like the eight, it would be like the 18th from his guy. And his guy, and I'm going to get his name wrong, but it's got the goofy, it's like like Bobby Robbie. It's something like that. It's like a, he's got a rhymy name. And his guy is like some buddy from high school who's now like Drake's front man, which is also part of like the charm of Drake, right? So Bobby Robbie calls us and says, you know, Drake wants to come, but he's really busy and he's doing three shows and, you know, he's going to try to come on Saturday. So we're like, great. We don't want to get anybody too excited about this. But we tell Sophie's mom, that Drake might be able to come this weekend. Just keep her sort of in cute clothes. <laughs> so <laughs> she has to make something up. She sends her sister, the, Sophie's aunt, to the Adidas store at Water Tower across from the hospital, comes back with all this cute stuff, and, and says, oh, we forgot to give you all your birthday presents from 
so-and-so out of town. <laughs> Makes up this whole thing. So she's got like now a bucket of cute clothes so she doesn't have to wear just hospital jammies. Bobby Robbie calls and says, he's not gonna make it, he's a little bit sick. And I say, okay, she's immune compromised. A little bit sick, no. Like he can't come like today, tomorrow, the next day. Sorry, all bets are off, Drake. Like Bobby Robbie, just have, a, have him call and we'll coordinate the phone call. Apparently, a little bit sick was like a late night. So Sunday morning, Bobby Robbie, because once I put the hammer down and said, oh, he can't come. I mean, to move, I mean, compromised little girl. Bobby Robbie calls Sunday morning and goes, he's fine. It was like a headache. He's fine. So the great thing, amazing thing, this man is so generous and kind. He said, I don't want to make a big deal. I, I want to come off the freight elevator. I don't want to make a big deal. And I'll, I don't want a lot of people in the room. I want to be in and out, right? So brought him up the freight elevator. I said, we're going to have a really small, tiny camera crew. We'll have like one of my guys with a video and like one or two people from our department and the family. And that's it. They were fine. So he comes in and um, stayed for 45 minutes with all of us, let us film the whole thing, and then stayed for another half hour alone with Sophia. Said, like, I, we just need a little buddy time. And they bonded over it. They both love owls. <laughs> Go figure. Who knew? I think she knows everything about him, though. Like, I really think she knew this. But they bonded over owls and Justin Bieber, because Beeps and Drake are friends, and so... Sophia and they bonded over that and he sent her like after the whole thing he gave her and her mom his personal number he wanted to know like he wanted a phone call when she got the heart and then after the meeting he sent her and Sophia said this which was awesome a box of merch <laughs> <laughs> I think I just learned that word right big box of merch Scorpio was his album, like all this stuff. She was super excited. So I don't know if I have another video here. Okay? It's on the next one. Okay. Oh no, it's on that one. I'm here. Because there's one other person. Oh shit, I got. so that we could push it out to the media, so that we could put our message on there, get our cardiologists on there, talk about how we're number three in heart. So we didn't just push out the Drake-Sophie moment, we have that in like every time version you can imagine, right? So we, we cut that a million ways. And then um, she got her heart. So, oh wait, hold please. So that's, we just played that. Okay, I got this thing. So that's what you just saw. And then, as I said, we put that together and we sent it everywhere. And if you weren't picking it up, you were going to pick it up because we made sure you were going to pick it up. And then she got her heart. And we lost control for a minute because her aunt filmed it. And we didn't want to film this moment because out of deference to the donor family, we felt like this was a very sensitive issue and we wanted to save this moment until after, but her aunt filmed it. So I think I have a play on that too. Maybe? Yes. So you can see this. Okay. 
turn it off. Basically, she got her heart. was her ventricular assist device next to her. And you could see how much better and stronger she got when she got on the VAD, too. She just looks like a different kid. Um, but we didn't want that out in the world. And so this is what happens with social, and that's why I wanted to share this, is be, as much as we want to control that shuffle, that triangle, stuff happens, right? So this got out in the world, so we had to take, try to wrest that control back. Um, we, so at, we said, got her family together and said, let's get the heart in her, let's let her heal for a little bit, and then let's do a major press conference, and let's get everybody together. Now, Ellen's calling, the Today Show's calling, everybody wants Sophie, and we have to say, we have to control our better, you know, sleazy publicist instincts to say, <laughs> yeah. we have to say, like, let's let, let's make sure this works, right? So. She um, did incredibly well. She said, like, if, if that little, so I had this rule when I was in advertising, like, no tears in advertising, right? Like, no, you just don't cry. Like, I don't care how bad it is, I'm gonna suck it up, and I'm not gonna cry. I cry like five times a day at this job. <laughs> like, and part of it is probably hormonal and where I am in my life, but also, all this stuff happens. So like, it's, I'm just like a mess constantly. So she said to us, when we were talking about doing this, she said, well, I think this heart found its home. I mean, I was on the floor. I was just like, oh, okay, oh, we need a press conference. So we, um, and, and it really did. I mean, she just bounced back so quickly and did so incredibly well. So we got her whole care team together. We got everybody to come to Chicago. Katie Snow did a special feature on her. It was incredible. So let's play this. Thank you. I don't think there's a play on this one. It might be the next one. Yeah, here we go. Just checked in with the hospital. She's actually awake now. You know, a lot of people have been dancing to Drake's hit all summer in my feelings, right? And now with her new heart, Sophia's doctors expect her to be able to dance right along with them. <laughs> Sophia Sanchez only wanted two things for her 11th birthday. A visit from rapper superstar Drake. Please, 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 Drake came through. Oh my god! <laughs> you asked me to come, I'm here. Drake, Drake. Hey. So I'm in the Lloyd Shadens Hospital, and look who came to surprise me. Just for you, my dear. Drake. And soon after, the biggest gift of all, the gift of life from a donor heart. And my other wish is to get a heart. Yeah? Which is not Well, guess what? It happened today. You're getting a heart. Congratulations! I'm getting a heart! On Monday, Sophia underwent a successful heart transplant, a nine-hour operation at Chicago's Lurie Children's Hospital. Spunky. Spunky is the word. Her surgeon, Dr. Carl Backer, gives his spunky patient an excellent prognosis. Cheerleading. She'll go back to being a cheerleader. Being a kid. Going to school. Doing all the regular things. And part of those regular things will hopefully include hanging out with her best friends, Gigi and Maddie, who are busy making get well cards for Sophia. And reuniting with her teachers at the Kingsley School, who call her a ball of energy and a fighter. It's a really happy thing. Uh, and we're just so excited. 
Even Drake sent his well wishes, writing on Sophia's Instagram, my love, so happy for you. And while we may never find out who Kiki loves, this little girl can now keep on dancing and loving to her new heart's content. Oh, it's a great story. Oh, There's that, every that time critical time. period of 24 hours or 48 hours after a transplant. How is she doing? So far, so good. I just checked in with the hospital. They said prognosis still excellent. By the way, guys, the doctor that we interviewed who did the, the heart transplant, he had to Google Wikipedia to figure out who Drake was. <laughs> Kids were way more impressed about the Drake thing yeah, than about true. him doing the heart surgery. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's true. Right. Most important. And By the way, Sophia, if you're watching, since you're awake and learn, if you're watching us this morning, come on by. We yeah. have to meet you in person. Yeah. 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 And happy. sending love to the donors. Yes. Yeah. Like, Oh, yeah. And you know, they really want people to remember kind of at this moment that donors are important yeah. and maybe check that box. Yeah, for sure. Lots of little Sophia's mm -hmm. waiting for a heart. That's right. The ultimate paying it forward. That's right. Yeah. Thanks for making a smile, Kate. You're welcome. Thank you. So we got our message in their mouth. And that for us was the most winning thing we could do, right? So almost 7,000 placements, probably more. We stopped measuring after a while. $20 million in ad value that we was worth staying up all night for. Um, Facebook alone, we got so much engagement and so much share, we never boosted a single post. So that was pretty amazing. And um, that's the story. So, and then we really believe as part of this sort of, sort of strucky notion is from social to pay to back again. So we currently have a campaign around um, these two girls whose doctor actually is curing thalassemia through genetic medicine. And she, her, her research has been published and um, there's a, you guys will understand this better than I, some drug that's really cool that's doing this. And so in concert with the drug company, we promoted the excitement of that. And now we're focusing on the kids and their social story, and PBS called us, and they're shooting a documentary with um, Ken Burns <laughs> called The Gene, based on the book that won like the Nobel or Pulitzer or something. And I'm clearly from advertising and not pharma, right? <laughs> or something, I don't know. And um, they're, they're shooting Dr. Thompson and the girls, and they're gonna shoot their uh, harvest treatment. So, mm -hmm. like, that's amazing, right? So all of this is working. And um, here's the basic takeaway, right, to be strucky. Remember looking for those authentic, inspirational human truths, right? We knew when we met Sophia that she was going to be a shining star way more than Dr. Alexis Thompson, even though Dr. Thompson is changing the world. Sophia has that emotional human thing that we knew was going to be amazing. Take the patient perspective, never the sales force. And I think some of you guys were saying that in your, in your presentation, right? This isn't about selling Lori Children's, it's about sharing her perspective. Use a course to tell the story, key, right? Everything we did was using a course to tell that story. Localize and humanize everything. We started with local media. We got, we made this, we talked to her doctors. We found out Kate Snow is from just, uh, Downers Grove, D suburbs, we have a bunch of them, from Downers Grove, and that her mom was a school teacher. So we pitched that angle to her, and she ate it up like crazy, localized and humanized everything. And then remember, shareable, shareable bite-sized emotions. So we didn't push out those big pieces. We pushed out little pieces. We shared big pieces with the media so that they could decide how to do it. But that's the whole thing. He had to put the metal key on the thing, or there would be no electricity, right? It's that idea of luck and strategy. Thank you. Questions, concerns, issues? Hello. First off, I want to say that that's amazing, and I commend you for recognizing the need of creating a um, multi-channel strategy from the top 
and how the key players within your organization play into that. Because I think that's the challenge for many organizations is that those at the top don't see the value in social or they don't see the value in SMS or these many different challenges. So I commend you on that and recognizing that. Um, one thing you said about authenticity. Can you, well this is two questions, but I'm sorry. Um, authenticity, how did you, how did you get her parents or to buy into this notion, knowing that there could have been a possibility of her not actually getting the heart? And then if that was the case, how, what was the, um, what was the plan to deal with that if Sophia actually did not get a heart transplant? So great questions. Um, first of all, uh, unique, family situation. She, her parents are divorced and it's not happy and her dad has a restraining order and so we are only dealing with her mom. And her mom has, knows her little girl and knows that this girl is spunky and there's no keeping her down. So we knew that from the get-go. When, when we met Sophie, we met Natalie, we met the whole family and they were part of our journey so it was a lot easier. And the same thing with, with Justin, holy balls. Um, we, we knew the whole family. So that's part of that beauty of having a story catcher. I didn't know the whole family, but Bridget did, because she's living in the halls. And Kathleen Keenan, we have like three people that basically live in the halls. And they get to know the whole family. So part of that is finding those people where we know from the get-go that mom, dad, grandma, whomever is supportive of this. So that really helps. And then to your part, remember where I said we lost control for a minute? We didn't want to talk about her getting a heart. We didn't want that. That wasn't our piece of the story because of your point. Like if she was waiting on the list for a long time, we were gonna let this go, right? If she never found a heart that was a match, if God forbid the transplant didn't go the way it did, we wanted to stop the story with Drake's visit you know, keep that alive for a while, but then, okay, we're done. And then we'll see if we'll pick it up later. But because the aunt put that out there, because they, she, I mean, everybody is social savvy, right? She knew. We had to stay with it, and we talked about that all the time. And we were prepared, if something went badly, to talk about that. I mean, part of what, part of what I've, I think, tried to do in changing kind of culture at the hospital, to your point about like starting at the top and giving everybody to think differently, I'm always saying these three words to everyone, authentic, inspirational, and aspirational. We, and, and part of being authentic and inspirational is sometimes we're not going to tell heavy stories. And we have to be prepared for that. Because sometimes we can inspire people authentically through some of the not so happy things that happen. But, but our brand is an optimistic brand. We would never tell it in a pessimistic way. We would never say, well, you know, we knew this was gonna go badly. But we have to be prepared for that. Thank you for your question. Okay, we have time for a number of questions. <laughs> so thank you so much. Okay, so. thank you for your really good questions. <laughs> Thanks.